Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I am Ken Woods, the Artistic Director of Colorado Mahler Fest, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome back Peter Davison, a Mahler Fest stalwart for many years now, a regular speaker at our symposiums and contributor to our online content as well. Uh, Peter, 2020 has been uh, not a great year to be alive, but in terms of uh, the deceased who have been affected by COVID-19, Beethoven would be right at the top of the list, who's uh, been cheated out of a 250th anniversary. Um, so today we're going to bring together uh, Beethoven's anniversary with our ongoing focus on Mahler and talk a little bit about the relationship between these two iconic symphonists. Peter, welcome. I can, yes. Uh, strange year, but uh, uh, Beethoven, I think, will never be forgotten, whatever happens. <laughs> I should hope not, <laughs> absolutely. Um, for a young musician uh, like Gustav Mahler, before he exploded onto the world stage, where would Beethoven have figured into his list of formative influences at that time? I think he would have been close to the top uh, in terms of musical influences. And I think it's worth remembering that uh, in 19th century Vienna, when Mahler was training as a musician in the 1870s, um, Beethoven was still the king of all composers and a figure, a towering figure, an inspiring figure, uh, an almost insurmountable uh, presence within the musical world. Um, and Mahler would have grown up with that re reverence for the great man I mean, we've got to remember that until Beethoven, composers were considered to be entertainers uh, of the aristoc aristocracy, the church, maybe the state. Um, they weren't free creative individuals. They weren't filled with revolutionary ideas. Um, and Beethoven changed all that uh, in a remarkable way and uh, remained as an example throughout the 19th century of how a, an artist could change the world. And um, I think Mahler was very interested in changing the world. So Beethoven uh, was a great example to him, uh, just on a, on a personal level as an inspiring figure, a hero, if you like. And um, uh, there's no question that, uh, that, that Mahler would have uh, measured his every move against the example of Beethoven, whether compositionally, in terms of his life, in terms of what he considered success, you know, as a composer, um, you know, uh, he would not have considered by comparison, you know, the Strauss family as a model for his work. So, uh, you, you know, this is, this is really the importance of Beethoven. I suppose if you look at Beethoven's overall output, including the chamber music, including the piano music, song, opera, symphonies, that breadth of uh, output is in many ways similar to that of Haydn and Mozart, uh, although obviously less opera than someone like Mozart, and, and not too dissimilar from composers like Schubert, Schumann, and Brahms in subsequent generations. But had there been a symphonist between Beethoven and Mahler who so clearly seemed to try to rise to the challenge of Beethoven the symphonist as mm -hmm. Mahler did? Well, I think that would be Bruckner, I, I suppose, would be the obvious candidate. Uh, he um, worshipped Beethoven, as he also worshipped Wagner. Um, and we can see in the, the nine symphonies of Bruckner, or the, uh, there are 10, I think, or technically, but uh, um, uh, the, the Beethovenian model, if you like, particularly that, that represented by the ninth symphony, uh, although Bruckner never wrote a choral symphony, we have to add that. Um, but the, that, that model of what a symphony is, a, a sort of universal vision, um, something that had to try and resolve the biggest possible questions in the most dramatic possible way, uh, that, that influenced Bruckner. But I mean, Bruckner was neither technically the composer that Beethoven was, I, I suspect, or certainly he lived in a, a time when the Beethovenian techniques no longer applied. And um, he was a much more humble, rather ordinary sort of character. So he, for, for Bruckner, it was a big struggle to come to terms with how can I be myself as a composer and at the same time live up to the expectation of the greatest genius of them all. And I think this was a problem for a lot of composers. 
it, for Marla, I think you just saw that as a challenge. I think I think that it was something you had to aspire to, uh, possibly surpass. Um, but uh, you know, this this was a very high benchmark that Beethoven sets. I mean, I think we should just for a moment dwell on the fact that you know Beethoven was really one of the technically most accomplished and naturally gifted composers that ever lived in any time, anywhere, and ever will. I mean, you only have to hear a few notes to just hear the sheer quality of his composition, um, regardless of any aesthetic or other issues, you know, on technical level, just, just a brilliant composer. And um, that that's, you would expect that, of course, of one of the greats. Uh, and um, there are many composers who would, would have got very close. But I think just for natural raw talent, Beethoven probably beats them all. And for someone like Mahler, who had also a huge amount of natural ability, um, but I think the, the thing that strikes me always about Mahler is ambition. You know, he wasn't going to let anybody or anything or history or the example of any other composer stand in the way of his immense ambition. Uh, and that, that he may also have got from Wagner, but I think it was just innate to the man. There was something, Mahler was out to prove himself as, as a great genius of the age. And um, there's no better model for that than Beethoven, I think. One can see as much in both Wagner and Bruckner of the sense in which they could compete with Beethoven as in which they couldn't. I mean, Wagner seemed to turn to the opera as a genre almost uh, in admission of the fact that he couldn't compete with Beethoven as a symphonist. And uh, in Bruckner's case, you see that he, he really narrows in on a very small subset of Beethoven's music as, as mm. an inspiration. I mean, the, the joke is, of course, that he kept trying to rewrite the first three minutes of Beethoven 9 for his whole life. Um, and, you know, he, the big influence of Beethoven on the Bruckner symphonies, symphonies, I think, is that grandiose metaphysical atmosphere. Mm. Um, mm. Whereas in Mahler, one senses that he's gone just about as far as you can go while maintaining your own language in terms of capturing the full breadth of Beethoven's symphonic language, uh, nature symbolism, folk music, uh, humor, irony, drama, mm -hmm. the heroic style. Talk a little bit about some of the aspects of the Beethoven symphonies that we see mirrored or reflected in the Mahler symphonies. Well, I think you 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 named several of them just there. I, I think the, the 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 obvious one is the heroic style, um, perhaps most obvious in the Beethoven Fifth Symphony and the Third Symphony, of course, the Eroica. Uh... like the, the individual is pitted against fate or society uh, or against history even, um, but it very much the individual taking on the rest of the world. And uh, that sense really pervades right through Mahler's work. Uh, it manifests in different ways. I mean, there are more obviously heroic works such as the Mahler Fifth Symphony uh, in itself, um, but, uh, and also Mahler's capable of inverting it. So, you know, in the Sixth Symphony, the Beethovenian models almost turn inside out and upside down. Um, but, and by the late works, that heroic style has turned into something else. It's much more conciliatory uh, towards the other, towards the opponent, whatever, towards the, 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 the role of fate in, in his life. You know, Mahler's much less confident that he's going to win out. So he comes to a kind of reconciliation. So you can see a sort of development through um, Mahler's compositional career from the sort of naive heroic style that you get in the first symphony to a much more sophisticated resolution of some of these issues in the later symphonies.
but uh, and also Mahler's capable of inverting it. So you know, in the Sixth Symphony, the Beethovenian models almost turn inside out and upside down. But and by the late works, that heroic style has turned into something else. It's much more conciliatory uh, towards the other, towards the opponent, whatever, towards the the, the, the role of fate in in his life. You know, Mahler's much less confident that he's going to win out. So he comes to a kind of reconciliation. So you can see a sort of development through um, Mahler's compositional career from the sort of naive heroic style that you get in the first symphony to a much more sophisticated resolution of some of these issues in the later symphonies. But it's a parallel which you can find also in Beethoven in the late works where that sort of serenity of transcendence, those lovely late piano sonatas and the late quartets and so on, where Beethoven seems to have stepped outside of the heroic uh, as well. And we, we, we have Musse sein, es muss sein, you know, it's a kind of, mm -hmm. you know, what has to accept fate. Um, Um, so there is that heroic aspect you mentioned on the pastoral side and obviously the pastoral symphony I think is one of the most influential of works in of, upon Mahler um, maybe it's come slightly through the beta uh, through the Berlioz symphony fantastique you know a slightly more romantic version of it but I think the example of Beethoven uh, it was a work Mahler loved to conduct and he had very strong views upon it and uh, and he, he perceived it as the, the, the a work that depicted nature almost with an objective precision in the main, and um, <clears throat> uh, and I think there's a, there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, I mean, it's quite a controversial perspective on the Beethoven Pastoral Symphony, but uh, I think in Mahler also the nature is generally represented as something other, something outside of ordinary human experience, and <laughs> it has this numinous. Um, quality about it. Uh, and I think he got that from Beethoven. Um, although, you know, outside the Pastoral Symphony, I don't suppose we would consider Beethoven a, as, as, a, as a natural depictor of nature. Um, that's really a more romantic development. But I mean, Mahler was a master of it, and he integrated it into his symphonies as a matter of course. I mean, uh, you know, in a sense, almost all his symphonies are pastoral in that sense.
I think also that, uh, again, you know, Beethoven was a kind of rallying point uh, for the wider cultural community in, in, Vienna, in Vienna at that time. Um, and we see that in, with, with the influence upon the Secession in Vienna. Uh, you know, Beethoven was upheld by visual artists as well as, as musicians, as, as a kind of figure of heroic uh, grandeur and uh, a reverence again. Um, so I think, uh, the, again, I, it was sort of, sort of psychological level, this idea of the artist as a free spirit, a creative individual, somebody who stood apart from mainstream society, that comes very much from Beethoven. I mean, with Mahler, there is this contradiction that, of course, he was also the, the director of the Vienna Opera, which puts him at the very heart of the musical establishment. Um, but then we should also remember that Beethoven wanted to be an aristocrat. So, you know, <laughs> maybe <laughs> these things are not so uh, contradictory in that sense, because Beethoven was an outsider, certainly, but also in some sense, he created his own musical establishment and became the center of it. So that, that, that this, this sort of heroic struggle against the, the sort of collective attitude, um, one which the artist feels he can win, that I think this is really a crucial issue for Mahler. And, and around 1900, I think artists are just beginning to question whether this idea of the visionary heroic genius is really capable of delivering. I mean, we're on the verge of the First World War here and all the developments of modernism with Schoenberg and so on. So you can almost sense that there's this sort of dilemma. Can we sustain this Beethovenian confidence that the artist can transform the world? Or are we going to have to accept that actually we're rather powerless as, as history and fate and the world around us descends into chaos? It's a kind of, uh, and I think Mah Mahler's music seems to be really in that, in that little crack there somewhere between those two different perspectives. It strikes me that in his early works, Mahler is very much in the romantic tradition of sort of tapping into the power of myth and symbolism as a way of uh, solving the problems of life. Uh, and, uh, you know, you see this in the ring cycle too, that it's by understanding the sort of uh, undercurrents that hold the world together on a spiritual level that, that one addresses great problems. And in the latter part of Mahler's career, you get to the middle symphonies, uh, a lot of that somewhat naive romantic symbolism falls away. And I think in a way, the example of Beethoven becomes even more important in middle and late Mahler that in, in middle period Mahler, the idea of Beethoven, the driving force, you know, this really making yourself and remaking the world through the power of your own will and your own determination mm -hmm. uh, comes much more to the fore in, in Mahler's approach to the music. And, and in, as you mentioned with both the fifth and sixth symphonies, you sort of see this archetype of 
unending heroic struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, and and as, as you mentioned with, you know, Beethoven sort of creating himself as the center of a musical universe, Mahler mm -hmm. very much did the same thing. So I was gonna say, it's, it's quite a Nietzschean uh, phenomenon you're describing there mm -hmm. in, in many ways. Um, of course, Beethoven lived um, long before Nietzsche did. Um, and, but Mahler grew up with, with Nietzsche ringing in his ears, uh, you know, the idea of the Superman, but because, I mean, I think Nietzsche's vision is very much an aestheticization of, of, of one's experience, isn't it? And, um, uh, and, and he had these various individuals um, uh, in, in his mind who were the sort of towering geniuses of the age, who were an example. I mean, I think with Nietzsche, it was more Goethe perhaps than Beethoven, I don't think, uh, um, uh, and of course Wagner for a while uh, was representative of this kind of Ubermensch concept. Um, and uh, again, those ideas very much current in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, when Mahler was starting his compositional career. And so uh, again, I think um, this sort of modeling on the uh, the genius who rises above the, the, the crowd, you know, this, this is very much a, a driving factor. I think, the, as you mentioned there, the middle, the middle symphonies, there is a, uh, I mean, most commentators would say, well, you know, you know Mahler V is where modernism begins in music, you know, in, in certainly that tradition, the symphonic tradition, um, as though somehow that innocence, that romantic innocence we've had in the fourth symphony has just been swept aside. I mean, I don't entirely go along with this idea that some, some, some Amala woke up one day and, and just said, well, I, I don't believe in that stuff anymore. <laughs> um, I think there is, a, because the Wunderhorn r remains in those middle symphonies in subtle ways, uh, but undoubtedly there is a maturity, a realism that creeps in uh, with those middle symphonies uh, or, or almost like a rebooting in some ways because it's gonna end up with the eighth symphony and another visionary work. Um, with a text by one of those, you know, transcendent geniuses, Goethe. Mm -hmm. um, so the Fifth Symphony is almost like a sort of rebooting. We got, we got to go back and start again, and and build up this vision from from another standpoint, which is much more empirical, rather less visionary, I suspect. And I think that's that's what you perceive. It would be an interesting discussion. I think I'd have to have a long, long, hard think about whether whether Beethoven made such a similar adjustment. Um, in his late works, it's possible that, that he did, but I, I think it's less obvious because he wasn't a romantic in the same way that Mahler was, perhaps a little less candid about his inner life in his music than Mahler was, but certainly the deafness of, of Beethoven turned him inwards and away from the world. And I, I think you, you begin to see that happening from Mahler V onwards, there's a kind of introversion, a, a stronger level of introversion developing. Um, Mahler's going, composing from inside out, uh, much more, um, and by the late works, that's almost a complete process. The process is complete. You know, it's it's almost a, an, an entirely subjective expression, um, and perhaps sounds a little less classical and Beethovenian for that. I don't know. What do you think, Ken? Well, I mean, one always has to be very careful about trying to say this happened in a composer's life, so therefore their music changed mm -hmm. in the following way. But it does occur to me that in Beethoven, you have two big sea changes in his music and the first coming around the time of the second symphony where the hearing started to go and we have the Heiligenstadt Testament mm -hmm. and uh, and that's the beginning of the the middle period uh, and then as the middle period winds down there's this several year period of crisis when he was involved in trying to secure custody of his nephew Carl and uh, he had other financial and personal challenges and you get the sense also that he'd sort of exhausted his creative language uh, in those years when he was writing with such speed and fluency. And in Mahler's case, uh, just before the Fifth Symphony, you have this uh, hemorrhage he had in, in his office mm -hmm. in Vienna that very nearly killed him. And mm -hmm. uh, and then later, you know, before the, the late works, the, the famous three hammer blows of fate, you know, losing the job in mm -hmm. Vienna, the uh, heart condition and the loss of his, his daughter. Uh, so it, it's possible that those sorts of life changing moments of distress in both mm -hmm. cases sent them in different directions but on the other hand it, it one mustn't be too simplistic about this and i want to come back to what you were saying about nietzsche because if you look at the work that is 
considered Mahler's most Nietzschean symphony is the third symphony, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that work, you have a very clear reference to Beethoven's last major piece, the string quartet in F major, opus 135. Talk, talk a little bit about the Third Symphony, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what that reference to the Beethoven might mean and how that fits with the sort of Nietzschean worldview. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously the Third Symphony owes quite a bit, I would suspect, to the, the Pastoral Symphony as a, as a, as a, as a concept. Uh, I mean, clearly the, the, the Third Symphony is about nature. That's, that's, that's just what it is. Um, but... Uh, I think by the time, by the, the end of the 19th century, the understanding of what nature is has, has been put through the filter of Darwin, hasn't it? I mean, it's an evolutionary 
uh, it's understood now that nature is evolutionary and um, dynamic uh, and uh, um, it's a much more sophisticated understanding of the relationship between the different types of life, you know. Um, so Marla creates this sort of spiritual staircase, starting with, uh, you, you know, raw elements of nature, um, which I suppose you, you, um, relates very much to the Dionysian concept in, uh, in Nietzsche. And we have these references which were scribbled into the, uh, the, the Marla score, which indicate that he was clearly referencing Nietzsche in some of these passages. Um, but essentially, the, also, I think in that um, first movement of the third, the, it's the sense of elemental struggle. Nature is an elemental struggle from inert, unconscious existence uh, towards higher uh, states of consciousness and start higher states of existence. Uh, and we come through the various levels um, uh, in this, with the flowers, the animals, uh, and then this Nietzschean text, the Midnight Song, which is really a, the sort of dark night of the soul. The moment Mahler, if you like, says human consciousness is born out of this darkness, which is the unconscious world of nature. Um, and uh, ultimately in the finale of that work, uh, there, there is this sense of transcendence, uh, of, of universal love. There's uh, the, the, the reference to uh, the crucifixion and the compassion of Christ. Um, so it's, it, it's Mahler's own uh, uniquely uh, Christian vision in some ways of uh, that, that, that all that we know of spirituality grows out of nature. Now, this was quite heretical in Christian terms if, if you were a, a traditional churchgoer. I mean, if you were a Catholic, uh, then that would not have been the orthodox view. But this is very much the Nietzschean view uh, of of spirituality, that it, that it has to grow out of the uh, material world, out of the... Uh, and I think the reference to, to late Beethoven, which we get in the Adagio finale there, uh, is um, very much because in Beethoven, uh, sorry, in Mahler's mind, you, you know, the greatest human being who ever lived was Beethoven. He was the most evolved uh, and spiritual person known to the, the, to, to the artists of the day, and therefore to reference one of his sublime slow movements seem, would be entirely appropriate. This sort of serene inwardness, the sense almost of prayer, um, this this kind of elevated um, state of, of of spiritual ecstasy, which Mahler achieves in that movement. But also, we are, um, you know, Mahler is also in a Darwinian way saying, "I want to remind you that there is this great arch of existence, which brings us to divine love and compassion." Um, so we do hear references in that finale to the first movement, to the crisis of the first movement. And, um, you know, it's if Mahler is reminding us that all spiritual achievements, all attainments of higher consciousness are hard won. And they're, they're sort of sculpted out of nature. You know, they're, they're not, um, not as the orthodox view would be, uh, um, given you from on high. Uh, I think that's the, the difference, uh, say, uh, with uh, the, the Mala second, the resurrection, which is much more conventionally uh, religious in its perspective, although not entirely, as I'm sure you, you will remind us. Uh, but, you know, from there very much, uh, you know, the, the, that movement comes to a certain point, everything stops, a little bird tweets, and, and um, something is landed on us from on high, a, you know, a moment of spiritual ecstasy arrives as if from nowhere. In the Mala third, you feel you've taken every step on the ladder, uh, one by one, facing all kinds of trials and tribulations along the way, um, and had to endure this moment of, of, of midnight darkness to get to the point of religious redemption. So um, I think that's really uh, why the association with Beethoven, I, and again, it, it shows you the extent to which Beethoven is just placed on this pedestal in Mahler's work. You know, if you want, if Mahler wants to reference the best, then reference Beethoven. <laughs>